we go. So I'm now, whoops, you seem to be in there. Let me move you over there. Okay, so I'm delighted now to go on to get ready for our talk tonight. And I'm going to introduce this evening's speaker, Chris Carbone, who is the Senior Research Fellow at the Institute of Zoology. Uh, ZSL, and he's been running the London Hogwarts project, which he's going to talk about today since 2016. His research focuses on ecological studies of wildlife and human impacts on the distribution and abundance. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen now and I'm going to hand you over to Chris. Thank you very much. Are you okay there, Chris? Mute myself. Can you hear me now? Sorry about I that. I can hear you now. Thank you. That's great. Yes. Yeah. I've got to forget. You told me to mute earlier on, and I behaved myself. And now, <laughs> <laughs> well done. No, it's okay. Now we'll, okay. we'll let you speak up now. Okay. Great. Great. So thank you, everyone, for inviting me to come and give this talk. It's really, really interesting to be here. I'm so uh, sad to hear that some of you haven't ever seen a hedgehog in real, you know, a live hedgehog. Um, what a shame. Uh, and today I'm going to talk about London Hogwatch, which um, is a project like Maria said, we started in 2016. Uh, I won't just talk about hedgehogs because the project has broader implications to that. I hope that's okay. I'm going to talk a little bit about the methods that we're using and the team and how it's developed over the years, the project itself. Um, and uh, very, very keen to hear what people think. Um, and so hopefully there's opportunities to feedback on any questions and things afterwards. So. Um, the reason I was became interested in studying hedgehogs is that for years we've been developing at Zeta Cell uh, camera traps, surveys of mammals uh, abroad in various parts of the world. And, and then we began to realize that there was a really active program uh, next door in Regent's Park um, being held, being run by Royal Parks. And um, we've been, we started working with them in 2016. That was the beginning of the project. But um, it's really very fitting that we do work on urban hedgehogs because hedgehogs have been dramatically declining over the last two decades. Um, and the latest estimates suggest that they've declined in population size by two thirds over the last two decades. So a third by a third every decade. Um, and it's really, really tragic. And, and one of the thoughts is that the strong, one of the strongholds we think in, in the UK for hedgehogs is areas like urban areas and suburban, suburban areas. But actually, we know in London that they have been declining. I mean, in, in the, you know, about 20, 30 years ago, they did occur in central London in some areas. And now, now they're sort of gradually being dis displaced further from the center. So um, yeah, it's a really interesting area to study. They're a really fascinating species. Um, and I hope you agree through this talk. Let's just hope things are working. Ah, now. Right. Um, so, so the reason that we, um, so the, our, our project focuses on using camera traps to understand the, the key areas, hotspots of hedgehogs across London, the key population strongholds. And the idea behind this is, to, is that through gaining greater knowledge of populations, we can better target conservation campaigns and um, help to preserve the, the species in the capital. So I've just got to get used to my, I guess I have to use my touchpad to, <laughs> in this system. All right. So um, yeah, and camera traps are great tools for studying mammals uh, and, and other wildlife um, because they're really good at um, monitoring animals that are often nocturnal, often cryptic. Um, and they're great for understanding more broadly a wide range of species in an area. They're also very good for understanding human wildlife interactions. Um, as you'll see later on. So our project, as Maria, Maria was saying, started in 2016, working with Royal Parks uh, in just in around Camden. So this is just a sort of simple graphic to show you how we've expanded over the years. Uh, we started doing work where I live in Herringay, um, in places like um, Alexander Palace and High Highgate Woods and Queens Woods, and then started working in um, 2018, we did our first big surveys in places like Regent's Park, 
sorry, uh, in, in places like Hampstead Heath, Richmond Park and, and Home Park. Later on, we started working more in other parts of South London. Uh, and in the, during the lockdown, we had to sort of, um, we were able to quite visit as quite as many parks because of limited access, but we did actually start concentrating more on surveying private gardens and that proved to be really interesting. This year, things are expanding really rapidly. Um, we've got new uh, agreements in place. We've just done our first survey in Redbridge. Uh, we're gonna be got plans to work in Enfield and Hounslow, we're currently working. Um, and then we've got a new agreement to work in Kingston. So it's really exciting. We're expanding very rapidly uh, and um, hoping that things continue to grow. Having said that, the project is really run on a rather shoestring budget, and it's really relied on a mixture of, of different sources of funding and different commitments from different uh, individuals. So in the very beginning, we just had myself and, and a part-time uh, volunteer working with us. Um, and then over the years, we gradually built it up. An important part of our uh, work in this project has been through our students. And I actually, I noticed that Connor Lovell, one of our master's students has joined this, this uh, session. And that's great to see. But um, the master's students and our PhD students working on the project have been a tremendous help with this. They really have done a lot of work um, because it's one thing to collect, uh, to put cameras out and, and stick them out in, in the grounds and stuff. It's a whole nother thing to analyze the data and go through all of that information. And uh, people like Connor will know a lot more about that than, uh, than I do, in fact, because he's worked, these people have worked really hard on these projects. So camera traps, I think some of you may not be aware of what they are and how they work. And so I, I thought I'd give a few slides over just to describe what they do. So a camera trap is basically a camera, a bit like a, a security camera that's standalone. So it's battery operated. In, um, in the, you know, they have camera traps in some form or another have been sort of around for almost as long as cameras have, even in the early 19 sort of, 10, 1920s, um, they had some pioneers developing a sort of camera trap for wildlife monitoring. But um, sort of in the first, in the 1960s, we had our first really ready-made camera traps produced in the market, but they were hugely heavy and very expensive. Um, and then I remember camera trapping abroad in, the six, in 2006, when the, the film cameras were actually all quite efficient. They were actually very good and, and very cost effective and everything. The big drawback with film cameras, of course, is that you were limited to 36 pictures. Uh, and once the roll of film ran out, your, your collection of data stopped with it. Um, and then we had this horrible moment for about a year when they were transferring all the companies making camera traps started making digital cameras that weren't very good. And they were also very expensive and you had situations like this where a Sumatran tiger proceeded to sort of destroy cameras, several cameras on a weekend. So it became a very costly exercise. So getting a good uh, quality camera at a good, at a good price point is a really major development that's really only been available in the last 10 years or so. So in a way, though camera traps have been around for a long time and the basic methodology has been around, it, in my view, it's a very new field and, and very new and exciting and expanding field. And the cameras that are around today can be quite affordable. Um, they're about 100 pounds a unit or so for a very decent camera. They can take tens of thousands of images in a session and they take them very quickly and store them away in the SD cards and, and really brilliantly useful. They work by having an infrared sensor, or some of them do anyway, a passive infrared sensor that detects heat um, moving in front of the camera when the, when the animal passes the field of view. And then it takes, sends a signal to the camera, takes a picture, and like I said, they're very quick and efficient. The cameras, surveys that we've been using use an additional technique, which we calibrate the location of points in the field of view of the camera to give us a better understanding of how to interpret the data. What we do is get people to carry around meter poles in front of the camera, and that allows us to digitize uh, the, any, any, the locations of any animal we see and correct for potential biases in the records. So cameras don't work as well um, in thick vegetation, they don't take 
pictures of animals as far in thick vegetation as in, as in big open areas. And this method allows us to correct for some of the biases from one site to the other and make our data more comparable across sites and across species. So it's a great way to get the public involved in, in work. Uh, camera trapping is, is great fun, it gets big groups. And during normal times when we haven't suffering from COVID, COVID epidemics, people can get into big groups and we hand them a bunch of cameras. We give them some points in the parks to, to put cameras out and they stick them out. Uh, we get them locked up. And in two weeks time, we get everybody together again to collect them afterwards. So we've done a whole number of surveys. It's been great fun working with people on this. During the lockdown last year, we had to adapt our strategy and we started packing cameras in bags. They were active cameras, so they were alive, ready to take photos. But being in the bag, it sort of kind of, they kind of go to sleep while they're in the bag. Uh, we put them in their own sort of quarantine before handing them on people's doorsteps to stick in their back gardens uh, to do their own survey of their back gardens. And that worked really well. Last year, we covered about, well, at least about 60 or so private gardens, as well as a number of smaller parks. Cameras can collect some lovely imagery of uh, wildlife. And it's again a great communication tool, I think. Here are two foxes play fighting. Uh, we tend to, because we're looking at monitoring diversity, we tend to use to set the cameras to take stills because they can last longer that way. They don't, the memory cards don't fill up so quickly and we can get a broader understanding of diversity of species. But you can, because they take uh, photos on a very frequent basis, about one a second, you can kind of stitch them together to make these kind of fun little film clips. Here's one, I hope it works, yeah, of a sequence of a cat and a hedgehog feeding. I think this is from Twickenham area, roughly. Here's another sequence of a fox and a hedgehog. So we've not been terribly effective at um, advertising our project. And I'm hoping this year that we'll start to get our first website sort of developed. And we've got a Twitter site and I'll give you, there you can see it uh, referenced here in this image. Um, but you know, it's, it's, it's great. We have a lot of imagery and we should really take advantage of that and advertise ourselves a bit better. So the two research interns that we've had, uh, of, in recent times are Kate Scott Gatti on the left and Rachel Cates on the right. And they've been responsible for getting a lot of these imageries. So camera trap surveys can tell us a lot of information about the wider area um, and it's the wildlife distribution. And here are a couple of examples of that. So these are um, examples from two of the larger surveys that we've done in, uh, in the last couple of years. Uh, the one on the left here is of, of um, Hampstead Heath up in North London. We did a big survey of about 150 camera trap points there. And in 2018, we established that um, Hampstead Heath is a really important site for hedgehogs in London. Um, there was a wide distribution of hedgehogs there. We think there's probably a, around 100 individuals that live in the, in the park. Um, you can see that there's, in you know, most of the sites we spotted hedgehogs, we had a good sighting rate. All of these are really good signs that there's a healthy population there. In 2020, with COVID, I wasn't able to do surveys in these parks. So we did try to, we were interested in looking at how widely the hedgehog distribution occurs um, outside of the park. And so here's an example, an excerpt for in uh, Fitzroy Park, where you can see, um, in a lot of the residential gardens that we got our, our, our quarantine cabbage traps in, um, they showed all of them on the, to the west of Highgate West Hill Road, all showed hedgehog uh, activity. So we assume that there's hedgehogs through that area. The interesting thing is to the east of Highgate West Hill in places like Holly Lodge Estates and um, uh, Waterloo Park and, and Highgate Cemetery, we didn't find a single hedgehog in those areas. So it looks like this habitat would normally, I think, be very good for hedgehogs. And I know occasionally that you do see hedgehogs in this area, but when we did our survey, there's clearly a strong barrier, uh, probably partially due to the busy road that 
um, busy traffic on, on Highgate was still, but also because I suppose there are quite a few barriers in the way um, in, in the garden walls and fences in the area. But you could just see very clear um, demarcation between where hedgehogs can reach and, and those areas they don't reach very effectively. Here's another example that's interesting. It's, sorry about it's been a poor quality slide, but this is our uh, data collected on the hedgehog active sites um, in the Richmond, Roehampton, Barnes area uh, in southwest London. You can see the Thames to the north. And this has been an interesting area because over time, initially, we were introduced to the area by Michel Birkenwald, who runs Barnes Hedgehogs. Um, he had a lovely hedgehog population in this area and has been devoting a lot of time creating hedgehog highways in his neighborhood, drilling holes in, in uh, fences with the agreement of, of um, residents. And I convinced them that we needed to do wider scale surveys to see just how widely this population was distributed around his area. And um, it's been really interesting. So to the south, we had um, Will Dartnell helping us work, who's the manager at Barnes Common, doing, uh, helping us with surveys in Barnes Common. We've done work in the Wetland Center to the north and in areas of North Barnes. And um, it's looking like there's a really nice solid distribution across a range of, of, of uh, neighborhoods and public and, and, and park areas. So it's really, it's really a nice story. And it also shows that this is another important site for hedgehogs in, in Greater London. But interestingly, um, there's another side to this, this whole story. So if you go and explore further to the Southwest in some of the really large parks, places like Richmond um, and uh, in areas uh, like Roehampton University grounds and some sports centers in the area, those areas are all dominated by badgers. Now badgers are important uh, competitor to hedgehogs. They feed on very much the same things, but also they are a much bigger predator and they predate hedgehogs. And typically we do not find um, hedgehogs living in areas where there's a high prevalence of badgers. And so there seems to be a clear divide line between the areas where the badgers occur and the areas where the hedgehogs occur. And students like um, Connor and others have been looking at how um, the uh, badgers respond to people in, in urban environments and the kind of their habitat use. We're, the indications we have so far is that badgers are more susceptible and more uh, avoid human activity more than, than say foxes do. And it's probably really important in these areas um, to promote hedgehog conservation in neighborhood gardens and, and improve hedgehog highway schemes in those areas because they provide those neighborhood areas, residential gardens provide really important refuge for hedgehog in these areas where they probably won't be able to access the, the public spaces as well. We've also seen a recent sighting of a badger in the last year all the way up in the area of leg of mutton. So badgers do disperse quite big distances into the, into the city. And uh, yeah, they're a very important urban species. Um, and ideally we need to think about these strategies of, of trying to make uh, habitat available for a range of species, not just hedgehogs. There is also a kind of worrying decline recently that we found in the last three years that we've surveyed in uh, Barnes Common. We've seen a kind of decline in the sighting rates over the three years. It's not necessarily very conclusive proof that hedgehogs are declining because we ideally would like a longer time span. But I suppose with the intensive use that London parks have been experiencing with COVID, uh, it's not surprising that um, there's uh, perhaps a decline in some areas that are really heavily used by people and dog walkers and where there's high levels of disturbance. So some of our larger surveys offer other opportunities for, for, for looking at wildlife. So we did a, a really large survey at Home Park um, and with another uh, sort of grid of 150 odd cameras. In a home park, we didn't see sadly any hedgehogs at all. They have a very healthy badger population, also have a number of deer. Um, 
And this allowed us to then look at, at relationships between uh, these species uh, in this study, in this, in this area. But also um, during, in the last year or so, we've been uh, using um, machine learning tools to look at processing the large amounts of data that uh, we get in these surveys. We could get as many as half a million images from a survey of 150 cameras. So it's really important that we develop efficient ways of, doing, of dealing with these data. One of the most common species we get in, in the record are people themselves. Uh, our cameras are fairly, um, they're, they're placed quite low to the ground um, in order to capture good images of, of the small sized mammals that we're focused on. But we do get the odd incidental image of people and because there's so many people visiting parks, we get lots of them. And that's an issue that's quite a sensitive issue that we have to deal with. Um, we don't publicize images of people but we ideally would not would like to not have to go through them manually as well because it would save us a great deal of time and it would reduce the sort of uh, issues of GDPR regulations if we could too. So we're developing machine learning tools which can classify images um, and the people are we particularly good at classifying people in these. A lot of a lot of the um, machine learning tools are already designed for. Uh, identifying people, so it actually works really well. Uh, and we use that one of these tools to classify the human images here, and then we can use that also just to kind of get a broad pattern of human activity. So this is a, an activity plot on the on the right showing levels of activity by hours of day, and you can see that in this case, deer are active throughout the day and and the night, but they reduce their activity in the day to some extent in response to, possibly in response to high activities of humans visiting the park. We also see an interesting pattern in a similar sort of way with birds in Hampstead Heath. So this is a, a study done by Rachel Beasley. Um, and she looked at ground feeding birds in, the, in, in wooded areas of, of Hampstead Heath. Uh, this is also done, work done with Jeff Fager, who I think recently gave a talk here as well. Um, and we found that in areas where you have high human visitation rates around cameras that get high human visitation rates, birds visit those sites more uh, earlier in the morning, perhaps to avoid the high visitation rates of people than they do at, at other sites, very similar sites with low human visitation rates. Um, so the birds are adjusting their activity pattern, anticipating the levels of use that the park's going to use. And that's really, that's really interesting and will help us to inform us about how humans and wildlife coexist in these very busy urban centers. Now you could take the kind of complexity of analysis up a step further and this is one of uh, the results of, of, of one of my students who is a computer scientist, Ben Evans, who classified these uh, data from Hampstead Heath using a, a machine learning algorithm but then is also done a kind of Bayesian neural network analysis using machine learning as well to look at inferences between species at a level that is, to be frank, uh, a little bit more than I understand. And if you're confused, you're not the only one. But this could be used in future to look at interactions between species and a whole range of things. I think it's really exciting area of research, but I can't say I understand it very well just yet. So one of the things that um, we should have done probably earlier on in our in our work is to use existing data to give us an overview of where hedgehogs are in in Greater London, and there are a lot of groups that have been doing this and working on this over the years. So, um, People's Trust for Endangered Species, Giggle, um, Mammal Society, London Wildlife Trust, uh, have all been involved in. Um, monitoring the mammals in Greater London, some of them across the UK. And this is a heat map created from the hedgehog sightings within Greater London. People like the um, uh, Hedgehog Street group have also uh, developed really nice apps that you could download to your phone, making it really easy to instantly sort of record a sighting and it can give you a you know, reference using your GPS on your phone and it goes straight into the database. So it makes it even more convenient. You don't have to separately go to a website using your computer. You can use your smartphone if, if, that's, if you show, choose to do it that way. 
So we started looking at these data and uh, they're a really important source of information, but there are some challenges in using this. So one of them is that um, they tell you, because, because they're uh, offered it by, by volunteers, uh, across London. They can tell you a lot about the distribution of volunteers as well as the distribution of the species of interest. So if you look at this map, one of the biggest hotspots is, is the Regent's Park uh, in the centre of London there. Um, and the Regent's Park is an area that contains something like 20 or 30 hedgehogs, which is, is quite an important central London population. But it it's reflected so heavily in this map because it is also an area that's resided that has a lot of hedgehog enthusiast visitors going through it. And there are probably a good thousand or so hedgehog enthusiasts who are reporting these sightings. And that's why you have such an abundance of hedgehog sightings from this area. So in order to use this data in a statistically robust way, you have to somehow control for the observer bias in the record. So one of the ways we did this is we used um, areas where people had recorded wildlife sightings like foxes, which are widely cited across London, but um, areas where hedgehogs weren't seen from those same, region, the same, same areas. So what we assumed is if you've seen a fox and took the time to record it, if you had seen a hedgehog in the same area, you would record that as well. So we could count um, areas where people see foxes but don't record hedgehogs, as, as areas where there are no hedgehogs. Um, and this gives you really important information because then you can kind of come up with a balanced comparison between places where you have hedgehogs and where you don't. And then later on, you can lose, use that information against a whole bunch of habitat characteristics in urban settings like human density, the density of green spaces, traffic flow rates through the, through the capital um, and other things to compare against hedgehog occurrence. And our PhD student, Jessica Turner has been doing a lovely job just the last year or so looking at this. Uh, in fact, she's had to concentrate on this work more than she'd like because lockdown didn't let her do the other work that she wanted to do on hedgehog genetic population genetics. So uh, we got her to work uh, for a quite concentrated period of time on this. And it's proved to be very productive. So um, what she's managed to do is use the information to come up with a predictive map of habitat characteristics for hedgehogs. And it, what it does is it predicts the in the red areas, areas favorable for hedgehogs and the cool blue areas as unfavorable. And this, this map predicts some quite sensible things across the capital. So you could see in the center where you've got the highest concentration of buildings and uh, roadways and everything, those are not suitable areas. They're color, color blue, not suitable areas for hedgehogs. But as you move out towards the edges of, of Greater London, they get more sort of red areas that are kind of um, considered ideal habitat. There are some less intuitive uh, interpretations, uh, sort of impressions that you get from this these predictions though. There are some areas in, in outer London that are strongly blue. And one of the reasons for this is these are areas that are strongholds for um, badgers. I don't know if you can see my cursor, but in here you've got places like Richmond Park and Home Park. These, these areas also have high badger concentrations that are picked, predicted to have pretty poor, uh, hedge, be pr pretty poor for hedgehogs. Um, this, this work is still very much in progress um, and we've got a ways to go to test it. We're gonna use our camera data to test it further and refine the models and hopefully it will form the basis for becoming a predictive map, which would help us to sort of decide on new areas to survey. Another colleague, Robin Freeman has been working to help us with this work. And he has also created a, a, a um, a online version of this map, which you can use in, in sort of uh, interactive versions. So you can look at the areas around London. We're hoping to get that open to the public very soon, but it's uh, we need to first get permission from the people who donated the data in the first place. So we need to get license permission from Giggle and, and the like to do that. So just to give you a little bit more understanding of the details of Jessica's analysis, um, the models predict that things that are good for, for hedgehogs are kind of sensible. They're kind of green spaces. So garden cover is important. Allotment cover is important. Interestingly, it seems that allotment cover sort of more at, 
further distances from the point that you're interested in looking at the hedgehogs are is has a big influence i don't know whether that's because um hedgehogs like areas with a matrix of of allotments in them i'm not sure but um it's it makes sense that allotments are good for hedgehogs because they, there's lots of of gardens with lush soil and uh, lots of invertebrates living in them one of the things that's not so good for hedgehogs uh, in terms of hedgehog presence in, in London seems to be badger presence, which we've discussed. Um, and then traffic volume, funnily enough, is meant to be, is, it's kind of positively associated with, with hedgehogs in this, in this analysis, but that might be that because you have greater flow rates of traffic in the outskirts of London, it might be that it's a kind of counterintuitive result. So we're still trying to understand these models. They're quite complicated to interpret sometimes, but I think they're really instructive in, and give us potential to make predictions about future sites to, to survey, and maybe gives us some indication of ways that we can improve the uh, urban environments to promote hedgehog conservation in future. So there are a couple of other sort of key issues that I think you know, are really important in hedgehog conservation. They're, they're quite straightforward. So I just want to illustrate one of the big things is population isolation. And this is something that Jessica wants to work on in the, in the next year or so. Um, and she's gonna be looking at genetic structures, uh, of populations uh, around hedgehog population around London. So if people do see any, find any dead hedgehogs in your area of London, um, you should get in touch with us because we're very desperately keen to get um, genetic samples from, from hedgehogs from different parts of London. Um, but just to give you a picture of some of the challenges we have uh, in, in London, in the, on the left panel here, we've got a, a map of the area between uh, Regent's Park and Hampstead Heath. There's about a mile and a bit different distance, roughly as the crow flies between these two parks. Um, we know that Regent's Park has at, as many as 30 hedgehogs in it. Um, it used to have uh, some hedgehogs in Primrose Hill, which would have extended the, the population slightly, but they've declined now. They're only found now in, in Regent's Park itself. But um, the really nearest big population to the Regent's Park population is Hampstead Heath, um, and that is a really important population. Now, ideally, you would have connectivity between these to really manage to sustain the, the, the hedgehog's population in Regent's Park, but at the moment they're isolated. So the big challenge would be is, could you ever have reestablish a corridor between these? I'm sure 30 years ago, there was some degree of, of mobility of individuals between those two areas. But now things have built up so much. Um, if you look on a Google Maps in the second panel here, it looks like maybe there's a possibility that you could have some areas of green space corridors through, through the area. But if you look at a series of photographs that I took walking between these two sites, you can see it's extremely challenging. A lot of bricks, a lot of big roads, a lot of impassable uh, areas. So um, these are real challenges for, for hedgehog populations in future. Uh, and probably some of these challenges are um, not, it could be very difficult to overcome. But certainly on a smaller scale, we could greatly improve connectivity, uh, certainly within neighborhoods and uh, between neighborhoods where you've got hedgehog populations, as it will be really important. One of the big challenges, of course, and the big threats to hedgehogs is mortality due to roads, the you know being uh, road kills. And uh, I collected this individual for for Jessica's DNA samples um, just last year. It was right in the middle of the lockdown. Um, there's it was huge. Um, it was kind of quiet area, twenty mile an hour zone on a zebra crossing, and it still manages to get. Uh, run over by a car. Um, it's really quite sad because I was kind of hoping for a while that, you know, having imposing 20 mile an hour zones throughout London might be a way of reducing the amount of road kills to hedgehogs, but clearly they're still, still susceptible. So what is the future for the project? Um, overall, I think um, we want to continue to um, look at trying to identify other key sites in, in across Greater London. And our project is expanding 
and it's it's very exciting. I think we need um, to increase our, our our capacity a bit uh, so that we can uh, cope with all the demand because there's more demand out there than we can we can uh, meet because there's just uh, we have only a limited number of cameras and limited limited number of staff who can do the work. But um, you could see there's great potential here to do this. We have great challenges though. I think we need to do a range of different things. In areas like Barnes and Roehampton area, we need to kind of focus um, our efforts on the strongholds of hedgehogs uh, populations and really work with local groups who live in those areas. I think we need to consider other uses for public green spaces. You know, there's immense use uh, demands that people need to use these spaces. So we need to balance those needs with wildlife needs. We also need to be aware of um, the other, other urban species and how they use spaces, these spaces and how they might impact hedgehogs. And I also think we need to especially encourage partnerships across sectors in the society, across uh, stakeholders that run and uh, coordinate activities in, in the parks and public spaces, but also across different neighborhoods. We need to get people to think um, from outside of their immediate area and into their more of their neighboring areas. I find that particularly challenging, but it's really rewarding when we get groups talking to each other and, and comparing notes on how to do things. And so I'm hoping that the future of the project will, will get to the point where we start to know, have a good knowledge of the key kind of hedgehog strongholds, and then we start to working with local groups to, to help them develop um, stronger conservation uh, practices in, the, in their areas. So with that, um, I'm gonna finish by just thanking my partners uh, who've been involved in this project over the last number of years and our funders. Um, we were received uh, major funding from British Hedgehog Preservation Society over the last couple of years and from PTES. Um, a lot of our students and our staff who are collaborators on the project are responded by Research England and, the, and, and NERC. So thank everybody for contributing and thank you all for listening. So if you have any questions, very happy to, to, uh, to answer them. And if you want to find out a little bit more about the project, you can visit our Twitter sites or you can write to hogwatch at zsl.org. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. That was a really fantastic talk and gave us a, a real flavour of the project and how it started, you know, how you sort of started from relatively small beginnings, but it's really expanding and it's good that you're seeing where, where that kind of project might go next. I thought there was some fascinating data that you've collected. I thought particularly interesting was the kind of the, 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 the way that the, the hedgehogs and the badgers were kind you could see the distinct separation in the distribution in the barns area. I thought that was fascinating. It was nice to talk about hamster teeth because obviously that's where the LHS does survey work and it was it was interesting yes. to hear about Jeff Barg's father's work. So thanks for bringing that up. Um, and I also think, you know, there's, there's also, you know, the, the kind of fascinating um, interaction between humans and hedgehogs and other kind of species that share, share London and to see how they're interacting. There's been lots of, um, there have been lots of questions coming through on the chat. So without further ado, I'm going to hand you over to David. Can you pick out a few questions from the chat? If anybody would like to ask questions in person too, do raise your, your blue virtual hand and we'll try and pick up a couple of those as well. But if we start with you, David, that would be great. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for me. I'll, I'll bundle a few together just to, to get through them. But there have been, there've been several questions from people about things that can be done to improve hedgehog populations are there are there breeding plans are there sort of national efforts to improve connectivity hedgehog tunnels and things and are there things that can be done about relocating perhaps injury and recovery hedgehogs from unsuitable areas to suitable it's a whole bundle of what can we do to help our hedgehogs questions okay shall i have a go at uh, answering some of those yeah. yes so let's see let's start with Let's start with um, hedgehog highways. I think they are one of the, the, the really, for, for urban environments, a really, really important part of improving conditions for hedgehogs. So you could have a lovely neighborhood with a network of gardens, but if people don't have uh, routes for hedgehogs to get access to their gardens, they really, you know, it's basically space that they could be using that they can't have access to. And access to gardens is access to food for them. So it's basically like withholding food. Um, 
You can also, uh, if you've got a community and, and you've got hedgehogs in your area and it's a small area, I think it is important that we set up some, it's really good to get a community going um, and, and try to come up with a plan to help improve conditions for your hedgehogs. So a lot of people in those conditions will do some sort of feeding of hedgehogs and there are good sites um, like on Hedgehog Street or PTS that you can look up and get references for ways of effectively feeding hedgehogs without feeding other things, which is a, a very useful thing to know how to do. Um, you've got to be careful because feeding hedgehogs, you might also be feeding foxes and foxes are already doing extremely well and extremely abundant. Um, so yeah, um, I think, you know, we've got to be a bit conscientious that feeding hedgehogs um, is, is important in some cases, but um, you've got to be careful not to feed everything else. Uh, the hedgehog nests, you can get those as well. And there are some well-recommended um, hedgehog nests that you can get. Um, and that would be a really good thing to do. Now, translocating hedgehogs uh, is a much more contentious issue. Um, I'm much more in favor of finding out where your, where your strongholds are, where are the populations existing now, and helping to foster those populations so that they grow and expand on their own accord. And, and I think through that way, you could really strengthen the population a lot. The big worry I have with anybody trying to move hedgehogs from one area to the other is that probably there were hedgehogs, if, if you don't have hedgehogs now, and you move the hedgehogs into the area, there's probably a reason why you don't have hedgehogs. And until you improve the area sufficiently, all you're gonna do is make some hedgehogs suffer while they try to struggle to survive there and eventually fail. So they'll just fail again. And I think that's that's a real, really difficult situation that you don't want, you really don't wanna be putting hedgehogs into that situation, it's not humane really. Um, I could see potential in future of translocating uh, hedgehogs possibly in controlled conditions where you've got an isolated population that's the stronghold but just needs kind of new fresh individuals but it, it, we're a ways off of having to do that I think at this point. Um, I So that that's my view as an ecologist and I know not everybody shares that view. Uh, anything else? Did I, is there anything else I missed there David? I think you covered a lot, a lot of that <laughs> question. Um... Uh, there's another bunch of questions people are asking, uh, uh, sort of themed around where are you going to go next and how can they volunteer to help you out? Oh, that's so, nice. Great. If you can give people a hint of how they can do that and how they can get in touch to, to help. Well, we've got, I don't know, uh, we've got a big survey happening at Hampstead Heath next month uh, on the 19th. And Heath hands are going to be helping with that. I think they're they're present on this on this uh, talk, actually. Um, and, um, and we're going to need something like over 30 volunteers for that. Um, and we have other um, um, surveys coming up, and I guess we should be doing a better job to advertise them. So we'll be doing some perhaps in, in June in Regent's Park um, and other areas. So I think if you're really interested, again, you could get in touch with us on our email and, and, and maybe we can start coordinating a list of volunteers to, to do some surveys with us. That'd be great. Excellent, thank you. <laughs> we got the hedgehogs here. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Just... JK has brought her pet hedgehogs along. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Well done. <laughs> okay, I'm just going to check. Um, Ernie, uh, is it was were you wanting to ask a question in person? We, we weren't sure if you were trying to put your virtual hand up. Uh, no, no. I'm just saying thank you for that information. It was me that was asking about relocation of uh, hedgehogs. Okay. That's great. Thank you very thank much. You. Okay, so don't, yeah, don't forget you can put your virtual hand up if you would like to ask something. But I know there's plenty of still questions in the chat, so if you want to carry on, David, that that'd be great. But I'll keep a lookout in case anyone else yeah. would like to ask in person. Um, there's a, another one that I wanted to ask myself because I, I've, I've got some camera traps as well. Do the is there a difference between the low glow and no glow traps, and would you recommend <laughs> one over the other? Ah, well, <laughs> that's a very technical question. Um, well, so the difference between the low glow and the no glow um, is that at night, when you walk past them and you trigger them, uh, a no glow, you really virtually don't see anything on it at all. And a low glow, you'll see a dim light. And in my cheaper cameras than a low glow, you'll see quite a bright sort of red, ready glow. Um, 
And there is some concern that wildlife get put off the glow. So a no glow might be preferable if you've got a really timid species uh, to, to um, that walks in front of that you're trying to monitor. And you don't want to, you really want to do the most you can to avoid disturbing or changing the behavior in any way, shape or form. So, um, but I think for the work that we're doing uh, of a normal camera without paying the extra few pounds for the no glow and, and low glow um, is, is, is probably a better, it's better for us to save the money and everything seems to come in front of it fine. I suppose the only thing is if you're worried about your camera getting stolen, uh, people are less likely to see a no glow. So it'd be more secretive. Thank you. Yeah, that, that's something to bear in mind, probably, particularly in the kind of urban areas. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're going to go now to Jeff Turner Ross, who'd like to ask a question in person. So if you want to unmute yourself and ask your question, that'd be great. Yeah, thank you. Of course, just a simple question. We live on the uh, Redbridge borders with Epic. Nice. When, when are you starting your uh, survey in Redbridge? Um, whereabouts are you doing it? Ah, so we just finished one in Clayberry Park. Oh. And, and yep, and uh, but that the cameras were just collected just yesterday, today even maybe today. Well, that's, that, that's great because that's oh. that's ten minutes down the road from us. <laughs> <laughs> but it's too you're too late, I'm afraid. So, <laughs> we, but but yes, that's great. So we will be hopefully I'll start looking at those images. I don't know um, soon. It will be a little while before we actually do the analysis of the data. But uh, really excited to be doing that. Um, we're also going to be working in Valentine's Park, but uh, people were the but we haven't fixed a date on that yet. Okay. And then uh, the Epping Forest would be a wonderful place to 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 work, but we haven't organised that. But that's something that I've been intrigued by to look at for a while now. Uh, do you uh, do you send out updates where you're starting the work? Is that something you have to sign up to on your website? Uh, we so we don't have a website yet. This is one of the ambitions that we hope to do this year. Um, and, and it would be great to coordinate this. I mean, um, I, yeah, I think that the, our problem is that we have very few staff. So coordinating all the activity takes more time than it does to do the activity in some ways. So we've got to be a little bit careful about overextending ourselves. But um, uh, I'm trying to think that perhaps the best thing could be to write in if you're, if you're around if you're willing to, so I don't know, Valentine's Park, it could be that we would be looking for volunteers there. So I don't know how far that is from you, but. No, it's not far. No, that's actually, yeah. that's, that's 15 minutes away. Yeah, so there you go. All right, thank that you. That could be the next one. And I, I'll okay, work yeah. out when we're going to do that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. That's great. So we've got some volunteering organised as uh, on, on air. So that's lovely. We're going to just have one other question in person from Kennedy Crookshank, and then we'll see if there's a time for a couple more from the chat before we finish. So Kennedy, do you want to ask your question now? Yes. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you very much. Uh, I wanted to ask two things. One, the difficulty of corridors near main roads, for instance. The, we could have a, a set of corridors drilled through garden walls and whatnot uh, to the uh, east of uh, Camden Road, where there are quite a few squares uh, that could link up, but it's too close to the road. Uh -huh. But perhaps a more important question is, have you thought of being in touch with HS2? Everybody is rather down about having HS2, but may, you might be able to get some money out of them and get a bit of publicity. They'd get publicity for hedgehogs if the if that was an appropriate uh, the dead zone, the brown zone, if you like, round their their workings. Yeah, it's it's thank you, thank you, uh, Kennedy. It's a it, it's a very interesting question. Um, there are there are mixed views about working with different organizations. Sometimes I get I hear you know with people who aren't so keen on on it on on HS2 and and that sort of thing. But you're absolutely right. Um, it could be a way of getting money. Um, we we've thought about approaching them in the past, and I think it just never materialized. We did work um, on a, a with with an artist group to to 
talk about our you know our wildlife images from from parks and everything and we we worked with this group a little bit and they were going to try to get funding from hs2 but i i gather it didn't didn't pan out in the end because they never got back to us but we were going to develop a little project i mean you're 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 right that um railways offer a a a a vector at which animals can move across the, the, the capital. And, you know, they, you know, they can go along railway tracks and in theory, it could be a way of networking wildlife in a, in a very effective way. It's a matter of convincing them and getting to the right people to convince them to take that on. But you're, and, and they do absolutely have the authority and the finances to, to do that, whereas we, we wouldn't normally. So I, I think that's an interesting idea. Um, you mentioned roadways. I know certainly there are a lot of places in Eastern, there are places around the world where they do value wildlife enough to, to pay lots of money to excavate tunnels underneath roads to create um, passes for wildlife. They often tend to be bigger, more charismatic species like bears and wolves and things like that. Um, but, but, you know, I don't see why uh, if there, there was enough willpower that we couldn't do some of this stuff in the capital. I, I, one of the nice things potentially could, could be is that if you create nice, I mean, maybe it's too extravagant to go under some of our big roadways, but, but what about just making nice walkways that people and wildlife can appreciate? You know, that to me is, is kind of win-win situation where, you know, you can get out areas where pathways that, you know, you've created enough vegetation around them so that they support um, a whole range of wildlife, uh, including hedgehogs moving from A to B. So anyway, but I, I like the idea of, of approaching HS2. So if anybody has contact with HS2 and wants to put me in touch, that would be useful. <laughs> You okay, so yeah, do, 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 yeah, thank you. That was a great. That was a very interesting question. Um, we've probably just got time for uh, David to pick up one more question from the chat. So, if you got something, one last thing you could pick out for us. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, um, so there were a few people you, you covered quite well the interaction with badgers. So we're not asking about badgers again, but people asking about other things that might be predatory on hedgehogs, including foxes. Do foxes eat, predate them? Do Rats predate them and do martins predate them? Well, I think we'd be lucky to get some martins in London. <laughs> I think we would be indeed. Yeah, I've never seen any uh, stoats or weasels or martins or any of them in our camera trap images. So I'm waiting for the first one to arrive. That'd be lovely. Um, uh, so I think that the big one is foxes. So that that's a that's a important one. I, I see actually now Liz, I think I call, I, I got the name wrong earlier on that one. So hi Liz, by the way, up, <laughs> up there. Uh, Liz is gonna be working with us on our uh, Hampstead Heath survey. So um, foxes, foxes are an interesting one. I think the jury is out a bit on the, the impact that foxes have on hedgehogs. I'm sure they compete with hedgehogs a lot and there are so many foxes in the capital. Um, that I'm sure they have an impact indirectly through competing for food and space generally. Um, there is, I think, a worry that they might predate young hedgehogs, which are more, much more vulnerable than the adults. We also see uh, a number of hedgehogs with missing back limbs, and that may be sometimes due to foxes. Uh, grabbing the back legs and and causing uh, irrepar irreparable damage. So I mean I think it's um, you know they can have a, a bad effect, but clearly um, they coexist most often uh, you know very commonly with foxes. In fact, hedgehogs. There's no way that hedgehogs could survive without um, living living anywhere in London because they're without a tolerance to foxes. Thank you. Um, so yeah, and cats, other things like that. Sorry, cats and uh, dogs. Dogs can sometimes attack uh, hedgehogs too, and there's a number of cases of quite serious injuries due to dogs. Cats are a bit too small, I think. So thank thank you ever so much for all of those for the detailed answers to the questions and for a really great talk. We haven't managed to get through everybody's questions, but Chris, you said it will be okay if we passed on some questions to you yeah. after the ones we didn't get through. And we'll, what we'll do is we'll do something. We'll probably email.